Okay, good. You. Any other? Thought maybe I should apologize up front. I may need to pause during the service to get my breath. I was on some medicine that just wreaked havoc with my breath, but hopefully it works because it's supposed to help keep my heart in rhythm after they shock it tomorrow morning. So, <laughs> so we will see. But if not, let us join together in our confession and forgiveness. I invite you to stand as you are able. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sins. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. Question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Beloved people of God in Jesus, uh, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Let us pray. O oh God, powerful and compassionate, you shepherd your people, faithfully feeding and protecting us. Heal each of us and make us a whole people that we may embody the justice and peace of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Jeremiah prophesied before the exile in 587 BCE. In this passage, he uses the metaphor of a shepherd to describe the bad kings who have scattered the flock of Israel. God promises to gather the flock and to raise up a new king from David's line to save Israel and Judah. The first reading is from the book of Jeremiah, then beginning in the 23rd chapter. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people, it is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the lands where I have driven them, <coughs> and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. The word of the Lord. Be to God. Psalm 23 is a good one to memorize. This Sunday's readings speak of believers in the plural. And Psalm 23 applies the metaphor of the flock to each individual. Verse 6 speaks of my dwelling in the house of the Lord, which today's reading from Ephesians uses as a metaphor for all believers in Christ. We will sing Psalm 23 responsibly.
The author of our second reading reminds his audience that originally they are not part of God's chosen people. Through Jesus' death, however, they are included in God's household of faith, whose cornerstone is Jesus Christ. A reading from Ephesians beginning in the second chapter. Remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death the hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him both of us have access to one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, Lord. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And as they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves, now Many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to a land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about that whole region and began to bring sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise May be seated. Invite our young people to come forward for a few minutes. Good morning, good morning, how are we doing? Good, good, great, thank you. What did I bring along with me today? A teddy bear. Have you ever had a teddy bear? I had one when I was young. I wore it. A blue one. Yeah, you have a green phone. And you might even be able to find a teddy bear on there. 
I had one when I was young and I, I wore it out. It, it, it didn't last. When do, you, when do you take a teddy bear? Make a noise, okay, yes. You take it when you go to bed. I was thinking about that. I, wore, I slept so much I wore my teddy bear out. <laughs> you know, we usually think of Jesus, you know, calling us to love others, right? Calling us to care about others. But did you know that Jesus cares about you in your physical health? In our gospel for today, it says that Jesus take the apostles away to get some rest. Some rest. What is rest? Take a nap. Yeah. Or if it's dark outside, we go to sleep. It's Halloween, though. You get to stay out even if it's dark. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. That's so important because, well, th even think in the, in the Genesis when it talks about God creating the world, and it says God created the world in six days, and on the seventh day, you know what God? He rested. Yeah. That resting really is important. I've even read how important it is to take our nap or maybe especially sleep at night to get our bodies and brains even refreshed again. No. As you get older, probably you don't need to take a nap. But my great-grandchildren are still napping, I can tell you that. But I think that's so important to think about how God really cares about our whole being. Not just that we care about others or love others, but about how good we feel, our physical well as well. To take time to rest. Because I remember when I was young, it seemed like you could try to run and run and run and play and play and play. Yeah, but you do need some time of resting, and that's so important. And God cares about you that way. So, so let's pray. Repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for caring about us, loving us, even wanting us to rest, and give us always your presence. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. Somebody's helping me with treats. That's good. Thank you. Now you got to decide. <laughs> Grace to you at peace from God our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Anybody have any vacation pictures to share? <laughs> this is the time, especially probably in the next few weeks, when we think about, you know, taking a vacation. And so I looked up definition of vacation on the internet, and it, one of them said, a period of suspension of work, study, or other activity usually used for rest, recreation, or travel. Usually used for rest, which is, of course, what I was talking about with our young people. And we often think of a vacation as a time of rest, although I can tell you of more than one person who has come back from a vacation and said they needed to stay home. It was, vacation was so strenuous they needed to rest now. I think there's some similarity between those thoughts and our gospel for today, which begins, the apostles gathered around Jesus and told them all they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away to a deserted place by yourselves and rest a while. In other words, it was, it was time for a vacation. <laughs> they had been busy preaching, teaching, healing, caring about all the people. And in fact, Mark tells us, <laughs> Many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. 
Can you picture that? <laughs> so many of the people coming to Jesus that he and the apostles hardly had time for themselves, not even time to eat. That's, that's being busy. And so we would conclude legitimately they needed some time away, some vacation. That was the plan. And for that reason, Jesus and the apostles get in the boat. In our gospel read, they went away to a deserted place by themselves. Well, <laughs> they try to get away. But look at what happens. Mark writes, now when he saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As Jesus went to shore, he saw a great crowd. Wow. <laughs> Here Jesus and the apostles trying to get away for some needed time of rest, but the people would not give them that time. Checking out where the boat was heading, the crowds beat Jesus to that place. I mean, that's incredible. I don't know about you taking some time from work for a vacation, but I always like to get away a little while, and if members would have tracked me down and... <laughs> given me some work, not something that had to be done right now, just some work, I know, I would have been a little upset. Well, Jesus is confronted with just such a situation. The people not allowing Jesus and the apostles to have the needed time away. And so let me ask you, what would you have done in such a situation? I suspect if I had come ashore and seen such a big crowd, I would have hop back in the boat, <laughs> trying to find another deserted place. Telling the crowds, well, you know, I'll be back. I just need some rest. Wait, I'll be back later on, but you wait. Doesn't that sound about right? But notice, however, what does Mark say Jesus did? He, Jesus, saw the great crowd, and he had compassion on them, for they were like sheep without a shepherd began to teach them many things. What a fantastic God. Needing time off, overwhelmed by the needs of the people, Jesus has time for the people who came. He saw their needs. And once he felt their needs, he couldn't help but take time to heal them and teach them many things. He was so touched by their needs that, hear this, he forgot his own need. How difficult is that? Jesus felt compassion for them because they were the reason that he came into the world. We have a compassionate God who is never too busy for us. Remember that. I googled that word compassion. <laughs> and one definition was a deep awareness of the suffering of others coupled with the wish to relieve it. That describes our Lord. He knows our needs, our suffering, has a deep awareness, but he doesn't just know. He wants to do something about those needs. And so the writer of Hebrews tells us that we have this high priest, and he declares in the fourth chapter, we don't have a high priest who is out of touch with our reality. He's been through weakness, testing, experienced it all, all except sin, he says. <laughs> So let's walk right up to him and get what he's ready to give. Take the mercy, accept the help. Such compassion is one of the fantastic things we receive as we grow in our relationship with our God to know how important we are to God. Now, that's only one side of the picture. The compassion which Jesus demonstrated is also something about, says something about our calling as his followers. Our calling to be like him. To be deeply moved as Jesus is toward these people. Is this now what we as his followers are called to demonstrate as well? To show such compassion. How do we respond to the needs of others? I mean, obviously, we too can say, we need our time of rest, <laughs> our time away, our vacations. But I suspect the problem may be not being able to care as deeply as our Lord. Or maybe the problem is we have not been able to lay aside our own needs. 
I mean, as you think about the needs in this congregation or in this community or in the world, probably each one could say, well, we have our own things that we need or want. Jesus calls us to lay some of that aside and think about what are the needs of all the people in this congregation or in the community and surrounding area, and then how can we accomplish God's ministry here? Because such ministry is not just what I want, or what you want, but what God wants. Jesus ministered with such compassion and calls us to minister in the same way. I mean, one of the times you really see this is when neighbors are hit by a storm, maybe, you know, a storm of nature, but also when illness or accidents happen. And we often do see such compassion as people bring food or, you know, spend time with others, and such acts really are important. People are usually willing to help in those times of need. I mean, the news telling us about, for example, you know, people helping out in those tornadoes in Greenfield or the flooding up in northwest Iowa. But I believe we see something different here in Jesus' ministry. His compassion is not just in times of crisis, but as a way of life. The compassion which we see him See him reach out to maybe people who don't always receive compassion. People that maybe some were writing off in that society, written off maybe by even some of the religious leaders of that day. In today's gospel, it's the sick who are being brought to Jesus from far and wide. And Jesus doesn't avoid or judge such persons. And I say that because maybe much of the religious establishment of that day might have thought, well, those people deserve their illness. Much as today, some people in our society tend to think, well, those people deserve their problems. No, Jesus remembered that every single human being is created in the image of God. And therefore, for that reason alone, they deserve to be treated in a compassionate and godly way which is the way Jesus treats us. <laughs> Even though we don't deserve it, we fall short of all that we're called to be, and yet Jesus still shows us compassion and calls us to treat others as he treats us, showing compassion to all, which includes all sorts and conditions of people, all people needing compassion. In order to be compassionate, at least you need to be sensitive to the sufferings of others. It's not enough just to see the sufferings of others, but to feel it. I mean, it's possible, you know, just to see some suffering but not feel it. DeWitt Jones tells about a photographer who was walking down the street one day and he saw a man who was choking. What a picture, he thought. This says it all. A man alone in need. What a picture, what a message. And so he's fumbling for his camera. And when the man realized he was not going to help him, this man that was choking, he says, I'm turning blue. The photographer says, don't worry, I'm filming in color. <laughs> Just noticing suffering isn't enough. As one man wrote, too often we underestimate the power of a touch, a smile, a kind word, a listening ear, an honest compliment or the smallest act of caring, all of which have the potential to turn a life around. Think about that the next time you're called to show compassion to someone whom you may not even want to give the time of day. We never know how a simple act of compassion might be inspired by God working through us to reach another person. I love the way this story illustrates that this mother sent her daughter on a Aaron, and it was taking way too long for the daughter to get back. And so when the daughter finally returned, the little girl says, well, what happened? You know, and the little girl explained, well, she had met a friend whose doll was broken and she was crying. Oh, the mother said, you stopped to help her fix her doll. No, she said, I stopped to help her cry. I read where our English word care comes from a word meaning sorrow or lament. In other words, to show care, as this little girl did, crying with those who are crying, 
laughing with those who are laughing, rejoicing with those who are laughing, being willing to journey with people wherever they are, rather than trying to straighten them out, which never works anyway. In our simple acts of compassion and solidarity, God is at work to change and heal people's lives, just as Jesus did in our gospel. There are a number of stories about a statue of Christ that was somehow damaged. Not all of them true. <laughs> but I still like one of those stories. <laughs> it's a story that when World War II ended, the members of a church in Frankfurt, Germany, began reconstructing their bound out sanctuary. And one of the main objects to be restored was a statue of Christ, except that it had been broken apart. Well, they looked and found and were finding all the pieces, found all the pieces except the hands. And after a long debate, the congregation decided to put the statue up without hands, and under it they had the inscription, Christ has no hands but our hands. That job that Christ still wants done involves compassion. Indeed, as we open ourselves up to our God and grow in our relationship with our Lord, then we will experience such compassion in our own lives. And as we experience such compassion, then we are the ones called to show compassion to others. Let's sing about that compassionate Lord and our calling to follow him. Hymn number 722.
God has made us his people through our baptism into Christ, living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. One in communion, one in the communion of saints and in the power of the Holy Spirit. We join our voices in prayer. For the Church of Jesus Christ in this and every land, through the one who is the cornerstone of a firm foundation, join us together and build us up as a temple of mercy and peace. In your mercy, hear our prayer. For creation, cause new trees to be planted, restrain the melting of polar ice caps, save land from destruction. Like a shepherd tends her sheep, raise up from among us caretakers of all you have made. In your mercy, through our prayer. For the leaders of nations and the heads of tribes, where peace seems far off, bring it near. Where justice seems fleeting, bring it to light. Where discord seems relentless, bring harmony. In your mercy, hear our prayer. For the health and well-being of family, friends, and neighbors, heal those who are sick, especially Jean Voss's brother Pete and the family of younger brother Milo Renberg of Cynthia Root and Sarah Bengston's uncle passed away July 5th. Of Ken Hanron, who is having heart surgery tomorrow, Give courage to all who struggle with addiction. Touch with your tender care all who reach out to you in pain. In your mercy, hear our prayer. For this assembly and for the faith communities represented this week at the ELCA Youth Gathering, nurture the faith of young people as they encounter new experiences and people. Break down dividing walls and inspire collaboration among people of every age. In your mercy, hear our prayer. In thanksgiving for those who have died, make us certain that in Christ we are no longer strangers and aliens, but citizens with the saints in the household of God. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, holy and merciful, into your outstretched arms we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Please take a moment to share Christ's peace with one another.
Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, you have set this table with your very self and called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body for the life of the world. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. You comforted your people with the promise of life. Redeemer, through whom you make all things new. In the day when you come to judge the world in righteousness, and so with all the choirs of angels, with all the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. God, our maker, redeemer, and healer in the harmonious world of your creation. The plants and animals, the seas and stars were whole and well in your praise. When sin had scarred the world, you sent your son to heal our ills and to form us again into one. The night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broken, gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of and again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you, for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his acts of healing, his body given up, and his victory over death, we await that day when all the peoples of the earth will come to the river to enjoy the tree of life. Send your spirit upon us and this meal as grains scattered on the hillside become one bread, so that your church be gathered from the ends of the earth that all may be fed with the bread of life, your Son. Through him all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ has set the table before us. There is more than enough for all. Come. May be seated those who are using the individual cups to know that as you open up and take that bread, that that is the body of Christ broken for you. And as you take the wine and open that up to know that that is the blood of Christ shed for you. We join in, Lamb of God.
May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which you've now received, strengthen and preserve you unto life eternal. Amen. face shine on you, be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.